All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the actual Anarchy Podcast. Podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective. Tonight is going to be a fun one. We're going to burn one down with the <laughs> host of Cannabis Heals Me. We're going to be talking about Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. My name is Daniel Elwood, and this episode is 132. My co-host is Cockboy. How you doing, Robert? What's up, everybody? Back again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to have you, and and I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this one, and I, I don't want to delay too much, but uh, I think you've let our audience know uh, that you are currently working in a productive capacity uh, at a... How dare uh, you, sir? Food cart. You slander me. It's a bit of a change for you. So how's that going? Slandering my character. Yeah, I, you know, I had an opportunity to help out um, a relative and a friend, and he's got he's a a, a budding entrepreneur. Well, he's been an entrepreneur his whole life, and uh, this 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 outing has the highest potential for success. And he got called away on a business trip, and he you know he called in the reliever to come in and keep the business going while he was gone out of state. Apparently, he's telling me all these horror stories of driving around Iowa. Doesn't sound like a great place, but in the meantime, yeah, we're keeping the business going. It's um, it's been fun. If you're in the um, Okanagan County in Central North Washington, stop on by Joyful Thai. We'd love to give you some uh, fantastic Thai food. All right, nice little plug. A plug. There. Nice little plug. Yeah, we'll I gotta do, plug it. <laughs> we'll do one more plug, and that's for our Patreon, actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. You can get some live stream and pre-show, post post show, behind the scenes content available there. Uh, but Without much further ado, why don't we roll this one up and uh, get into the last night's portion of the show? If we must, let's do this. All right. Can I ask Robert a question? Okay. Do you have your food handler certificate? <laughs> I have a piece of paper that gives me permission from the state that allows me to pick up food and hand it to people. <laughs> All right. Thankfully, I'm, I'm... I do, or else, you know, what chaos could happen? How many people <laughs> could get ill? Nobody knows. Just probably infinite. Yes. All of the customers so that you would not have any more customers ever again. Well, if we could just if I could just get everybody sick, that would somehow benefit me in some some scheme, some way. I think that's I think that's the argument. It's probably the goal. So that was our our, our guest chiming in just a hair early. But but I think that was appropriate because we're going to not talk about the food handler stuff once we get into last night's portion of the show. Sorry. No, no problem. It's great. It's great. Learn how to make some coffee. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, The Last Nighters. And The Last Nighters are part of the Launchpad Media, where we're always launching new ideas in your direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. You'll find our show and a bunch of other shows, including Johnny Rocket Launchpad's uh, new version called Blast Off with Johnny Rocket, as well as Postcards from Somalia, Sounds Like Liberty, and The Law with DK Williams, among others. So check it out, thelaunchpadmedia.com. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Harold and Kumar go to White Castle with our guest who is from Cannabis Heals Me. I'll introduce her in a moment, but this is episode 75 of the show and show notes more at lessonarrow.com slash 75. Give us likes, subscribes, reviews, and all that stuff. And that'll help us get a higher profile and more recommendations out to other listeners so we can get some more earballs. Isn't that right, Robert? That is exactly right, Daniel. Thanks for spreading the word, everybody. If you like the show, check us out. Give us the like, subscribe, rate us, talk about us. Word of mouth is fantastic. You probably have libertarian friends enemies you know all kinds of people frenemies and, uh, hmm? frenemies yeah it's like a mashup you know mashup and also give likes and subscribes to our guest show our guest is rachel kennerly she's a cpa a homeschool mom and a podcast host of the cannabis heals me podcast you can find her show at cannabisheelsme.com how are you doing rachel tell tell everyone not only how you're doing but a brief you know like what's your show about and how can they uh, engage with you now I'm totally blanking. 
<laughs> no, uh, the Cannabis Sales Review Podcast, what we do is we talk to people who have used cannabis medically, and we share just kind of their journey to cannabis and kind of what their condition was, what life was like before cannabis, what life is like now after cannabis. And and we would just want to share those stories so that people can share those stories with people who are either you know, on the fence about cannabis prohibition or are dyed in the wool prohibitionist. So that's kind of our, that's kind of our, our gateway into the, into cannabis. And then on our Thursday shows, those are Mondays, our healing stories. And then on Thursday shows, we kind of say, well, what are some other issues related to cannabis? It's not just about medical. It's about, you know, what is, what is government trying to do or what can we take from the cannabis issue and apply it to other areas of our life? Right. And we touched on a fair amount of that in our pre-show uh, related to the drug war and basically carte blanche for the government and, and agents of the state to do whatever they wish regarding our persons and property. Uh, so that is uh, that sounds like a very um, interesting uh, show. And I recommend it to people. I've actually listened to a couple of episodes and I think you're doing a great job. You're about, what, 40 episodes in now? Yeah, I think 42 just came out this past uh, yesterday. We talked, we actually talked, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And so that was kind of something that I grew up always knowing that, or knowing, I guess, uh, being told that cannabis was immoral and it's immoral because it was illegal. So Jason Rink, who is a Ron Paul biographer and think worked for the Ron Paul campaign. And he's a uh, producer. He pre- produced a, a movie on nullification for the Tenth Amendment Center. He came on, and we talked about Christianity and cannabis. So how do we how do we resolve those two? Because a lot of people who are Christians have always heard that cannabis is immoral because it's illegal. So we talked about that issue. And I, I found it an interesting conversation. I don't know if uh, atheists would find it all that interesting, but I did. Well, I'm I'm interested, and I happen to be an atheist, so <laughs> I will check that out. Um, and actually, we had a, a really good episode on Easter about Passion of the Christ with the anarcho-Christian. And we were mm-hmm. talking about legality versus lawful, you know, like just because it's the law doesn't mean that it's moral or righteous. And uh, you can find so many contradictory laws uh, anyway. So like you would never be able to actually be lawful in all cases or mm-hmm. legal in all cases. But uh, anyway, we should probably get into our movie because otherwise, you know, we'll just talk like this all night. That's right. And that's not why people came. That's right. Yeah. We don't do important work like you do. We talk about movies. <laughs> but well, it, this is important too, guys. Well, it, it is a lot of fun. And Robert and I were talking about this stuff anyway. So, you know, NSA hits record, we hit record. So it, it works out. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with the Google description. We're talking about Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Came out in 2004. It's an adventure slash stoner film. That is one of the categories on the Google, apparently. Uh, one hour, 28 minutes, 7.1 IMDb, 74% Rotten Tomatoes, and 64% Metacritic. However, 90% of Google users like it. And uh, I think I would uh, qualify as liking it as well. Uh, spoiler alert, everyone. And here is the description. Nerdy accountant Harold, played by John Cho, and his irrepressible friend Kumar, played by Cal Penn, get stoned watching television and find themselves utterly bewitched by a commercial for White Castle. Convinced there must be one nearby and... The two set out on a late night odyssey that takes them deep into New Jersey. Somehow the boys manage to run afoul of rednecks, cops, and even a car stealing Neil Patrick Harris and PH before getting anywhere near their beloved sliders. The release date was July 30th, 2004. The director, Danny Liner, and it had a budget of $9 million, but made almost $24 million. I'll go to Robert for his initial reaction. Yeah. So Rachel, am I correct in understanding that this movie was your choice? I'm going to go with negative. <laughs> oh, really? This is a Daniel selection in lieu I... of your speciality? Well, yes. <laughs> I, I, okay. have... I remember it differently, a little differently. I have never seen Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Okay. Cause I was wondering you after watching the film and then you telling me what you do, mm-hmm. I was thinking, well, maybe there's a movie that deals more with the medical marijuana issue. And because I didn't really see a whole lot of that in this film. No, and there, there's not. I don't re- recall seeing any medical use. <laughs> yeah, not not so much the medical use. I mean, they seem to be having a good time. That's right. Which you could argue, I suppose, depression is a medical condition. Yes. But yeah, I don't know. Does anybody know if there is a medical marijuana movie? There is one called Weed the People is one of the ones that came out. Uh, Ricky Lake and I can't remember the other lady's name that did it. It's really good, too, though. But mm-hmm. it's probably not quite as much fun to, wa- to watch as Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Oh, man. There are, no, there are no rabid squirrels in that movie. Oh, rabid ra- uh, raccoons. Or cheetahs? No cheetahs either. 
Yeah, my kids love cheetahs, by the way. But I just want to throw in there that there is an instance of medical marijuana usage in this or an intention to. And that is when Kumar is performing the bullet uh, surgery, trying to get the three bullets out of the gunshot victim. And he says, we're going to sedate him with marijuana as much as you can get. And then uh, Deadpool says, well, we don't have any marijuana here. I forgot but, about that part. So there is that one tiny linkage to uh, to the topic at hand and her speciality. Now, I do want to also say that she did recommend a different movie initially, and I think I would have had to pay like $15 for it. So I think tongue in cheek, I brought up Harold Kumar. She's like, well, I haven't seen it. And then you saw it and you're like, yeah, let's do that one. So I wa- I'm going to kind of throw it as a push on who <laughs> who suggested this one. I was trying to save you 15 bucks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she saved me a dime bag, Robert. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. That's fantastic. Or, sorry, what was your name? It's Rachel. You got it. Okay, good. I didn't want to make sure I got it right. All right. All okay, right. So where do we want to where do we want to start with this one? Well, let's let's go with um, I think where you were headed with this, and I'll direct this to you, Rachel. Um, with legalization in a few states so far, and kind of this growing push for it, and I know you've probably discussed this in your show, uh, and it appears to be gaining traction and potentially overturning the law in the whole country. Mm-hmm. Um, and in your past, you viewed marijuana as gateway drug, as you as you said. And that the government had the moral right to prohibit or make it illegal and how effective that can ever actually be is another matter. Right. Um, but does a movie like Harold and Kumar or Cheech and Chong or whatever help or damage the reputation of cannabis? Because on the one hand, it's making it more popular mm-hmm. and lighthearted in a comedy film, helping to normalize it, uh, making it, you know, kind of like more fun and friendly or whatever. But on the other hand, it trivial trivializes it as well, making it seem like it's just for fun or getting high or acting stupid. So what do you think? Like, does a movie like this hurt or help in, uh, in that regard? I don't know that it's going to help, but it does. It, it kind of does ma- make it more kind of part of the vernacular where it's like, it's okay. And these guys, you know, they're not psychotic and they're go- not going out and killing everyone. They're just having a good time and, uh, and not doing any violent, you know, cause that's the propaganda is that it turns you into a violent person in you know, obviously Harold and Kumar are not. They just want hamburgers. They're less violent than the guy that freaks out in the drive through line because the White Castle closed. Patrice. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would have to answer that question by saying I think it depends on whether you're in the target age range or not for the film. I think if you're a young person watching this movie, I think it helps to normalize it. And, you know, you don't see it as a bad thing anyway, probably at your age, mm-hmm. at that age, as much as maybe you would if you were some kind of stodgy 40 year old or something like me. <laughs> but then, yeah, if you are some 40 stodgy four year old and you see it as a, well, look at these dumb people doing dumb things and look how it makes you do dumb stupid stuff. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both probably. Dan. Yeah. A bit of a mix, but I think, um, you know how they say politics follows culture. I think that was a bright part thing. Yeah. Uh, if you get the kids while they're young, mm-hmm. right. And get them liking this kind of a thing. And then that, 20 years later. Yeah. 20 years later, you've got, uh, Legal cannabis. Legal yeah. cannabis in all kinds of states. So yeah. who's had more of an impact on uh, your life, Harold and Kumar? Or um, I can't think of another example. Well, this is a very powerful film, apparently. <laughs> a tour de force. And it's a comedy de force, I think. I found myself laughing uh, pretty consistently in this one, but also troubled by how problematic it was in so many respects. Um, it's, it's one of those movies I don't know if they could make it today. And and I yeah, I'm wondering why the Twitterati haven't gone after John Cho and uh, Cal Penn um, about this movie that they made you know 15 years ago now with how un PC it is. It's I love it. I love that stuff. I, I hate PC stuff, but uh, you know this this was hilarious. Do you think they can get away with it because they're not white guys? It doesn't hurt. <laughs> you mean black people? You mean people of color? You mean uh? I don't know what it, I'm supposed to say today. No, I, I was playing off on the Fred Willard character. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I forgot about Fred. He's hilarious. The hemoglobin trobler, tro- <laughs> <laughs> hemoglobin trotters. Hemoglobin trotters. Is that what he said? Anyway, think- <laughs> this is this is a it's a ridiculous movie, yes. but it's also kind of intelligent in a way like like they're not dummies and they talk about some kind of, I don't know, almost intellectual stuff. In fact, Cal is uh, he's super smart. Or at least the character, you know, he's aced the MCATs. He's got all sorts of like high minded literature on his bookshelf, including the Grand Chessboard by Zbigniew Brzezinski, which is kind of interesting that that's thrown in there. 
Um, and then, you know, Wait, John, which character are we talking about? Uh, Harold or Kumar? Kumar. Okay. And then Harold, the John Cho character, uh, who my first interaction with him or first exposure to him was um, when he talked about that chick's a MILF in, <laughs> in American Pie. <clears throat> so he'll forever be the, <laughs> the, MILF, the MILF guy. The MILF. I like it. Uh, but, you know, he's, um, he's the Asian guy and he loves masks. So he probably made his weekend. Yeah, he was. I like the fact that even though they're stoners, they're not sit on the couch. I guess their friends are kind of sit on the couch stoners, but these guys are, you know, Harold's got a job and Kumar is super smart. So they don't fit the typical stoner categories when you just look at them on the outside. Although Kumar, I would say, is definitely not like striving to succeed, even well, though that- he has all the credentials and all the ability. But that's not necessarily due to his love of weed. I mean, maybe it has some part of it, but he also just seems to be kind of not being super interested in being a doctor at this point. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing. Like, when you're 21, 22 years old, like, do you really... How many people really know what they want to do? You know, it's like people just go to college because that's, like, the next thing. And right. uh, it's just... In a way, it keeps you still um, uh, infantilized. You know, like, you don't have to grow up just yet. You can kind of stay in that cozy, safe space, and it's become ever more safe. Uh, so safe that you can't even have any uh, <laughs> any opinions of your own or be exposed to any new ideas. Yeah, and if anybody's saying anything that runs counter to that, then we're, we shout them down or we throw things at them. Right, because words are violence now, apparently. <laughs> it's extreme. Extreme, bro. Learn how to drive. This is America. I did appreciate the 90s frat extreme boys that I had forgotten a little bit about the 90s, but they they brought it back for me. Did you have a hang glider? (laughs) I don't remember actually having a hang glider myself. (laughs) Oh, you know what? I appreciate that they have one on their truck just for, you know, just in case, right? Just for extreme emergencies. (laughs) Right. No, actually, uh, uh, Robert, I don't know if you recall, but um, one of our friends in high school had a uh, had a motorized uh, hang glider thing. I don't know if you in high school. Yeah. I yeah. did not know that. My buddy with the Very horse cool. farm. With the what? With the horse farm. The big field. Really? We'd go mudding around in that old, uh, what was it, a Datsun B210? Like the field car? We'd take it off. Yeah. we jumps. You never went up in no hang glider. No, I never went up in it. But or I, ultralight or whatever you want to call it. I think he had one, and I don't know if he ever got it running. But Okay. Well, it that doesn't quite count, does it? Well, you could imagine what it would have been like, Robert. I could get super stoned and imagine what it would be like. All right. So I want to bring up another thing, because you talked about how the uh, impression of marijuana or cannabis. And my wife actually told me the term marijuana is has racial uh, uh, implications or, or origins because it was to make it the devil's lettuce. And they have a poster of The Devil's Harvest, which is a movie from 1942 about how uh, marijuana or cannabis is so bad and evil. And uh, they have a PSA <laughs> in yeah. the movie. I saw where, that. Where this one, these two kids, one of them, takes a puff for the first time ever. And he's like, oh, I'm so high. And he grabs a gun and shoots himself. <laughs> that was a real thing right in the movie? Yes. At 10 minutes and 25 seconds. Oh, you have a note on this. All right. I do. <laughs> uh, well, the the history of, because cannabis was actually on the U.S. pharmacopoeia from 1850 to 1942. And so Harry Anslinger, when he was at a job, when alcohol prohibition was no more, you know, no, no government bureaucrats go away. Their jobs always stay and they shifted gears and started going after cannabis. But because cannabis had all these medicinal benefits and was in the pharmacopoeia, they had to call it the scary thing, uh, marijuana, that the Mexicans used, that all the crazy Mexicans and jazz singers used. So they when they talked about how scary marijuana was, it's, you know, they just use fear like they do with everything else. This is the most important election of our time. So you have to vote now. Otherwise, blah, blah, blah. So it's just fear mongering by politicians and bureaucrats and the war on drugs was no exception to that. Yeah. Yeah. Something, sometimes things never seem to change, right? Like it's their modus operandi. Yeah. I mean, that's, and I know y'all aren't Christians, but in in the Bible, it talks a lot about, you know, just do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And so I always think, because that's what politicians try to use to control us. Well, how, how, how do we get them to give up more control of their lives? Well, we make them scared. We make them scared of terrorists. We make them scared of the crazy Mexicans and their marijuana. And the, uh, so that's a fear is a powerful motivator. Absolutely. It is. You're 100% about right. You're right about that. And it seems to keep working over and over and over again, because yeah. people keep seeing them follow it, fall for it all the time as if politicians have ever done anything to engender trust. But apparently the propaganda continues and people fall for it. Every every couple of years, they fall for it again. And then 
the politician does the exact opposite of what they said they were going to do. Yeah. And somehow people haven't caught on to this. I don't understand why. Uh, <laughs> it's like a recency bias. Like, well, they said this and then you forget it. Right. And then mm-hmm. they do something different and no one seems to like ever call them on it. But yeah, I had the. Yeah. I mean, I know my friend, the Obama apologist, likes to say that, well, Obama was just a really good guy. And he wanted to shut down Guantanamo and he wanted to end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But those damn Republicans just wouldn't work with him. And, you know, he's just a really good guy, but he can only do so much. Right. Even though he's the freaking commander in chief of the military. And that's pretty much one of the things you actually can do is tell the military what to do. Yeah. No matter who, who you vote for, you get John McCain. Uh, bringing out the woods isms. <laughs> I had the uh, the opportunity to go see a Ted Cruz rally when he was running against Beto. And it was, man, it was just the most predictable tripe. And I'm like, people are actually listening to this. Of course, I think the median age of the folks that were there was about 65. So I brought the, I brought the average down a little. Uh, but I mean, like, I mean, they were like eating it up with a spoon. I'm like, this is just the same stuff that, all of the politicians say, and y'all actually believe this? Yeah, and I've actually seen Cruz um, do some like man on the street kind of debates, and he seems pretty open to having people like be able to finish their thought and actually engage with him. And I, I do give him a little bit of credit for that. Um, but he's still a politician. But right. I think he still he he makes more sense than most. Um, well, but that's the bar is very very low. Yeah. Well, I, I now I would agree with that because I've seen interviews where he's just talk to people one-on-one. And so I was really expecting a little bit more from this campaign stop. And it was just, he just, it, he was just repeating talking points. Now we, we had a qu- question and answer session. And so I asked him a question related to foreign policy and specifically about, you know, what is, what does success look like in Afghanistan and why are we in Yemen and his talking point for, for Yemen. Of course he tried to say that he was, he was a libertarian when it comes to foreign policy. And uh, I found that pretty laughable. And but he also said in Yemen, because they're a uh, it was a proxy war with Iran. And it's just you only get a chance to ask one question. You don't get to kind of go back and forth with him. So at the end of it, I gave him a copy of Scott Horton's book, Fool's Errand. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, something he'll probably never read, but should. No, no. But maybe some maybe a staffer will read it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't mean to go into Cruz territory too much here, but um, you mentioned Beto, mm-hmm. who lost to Cruz. So how come he's like some hot Democrat presidential candidate at this point? It seems really bizarre. Like, and he seems like such a beta <laughs> loser dude. I yeah. don't know what the appeal is. Yeah, I mean, he lost to Ted Cruz, and they they spent like the they spent twice what Ted Cruz spent, and he still lost to Ted Cruz. And it's like, if he can't beat Ted Cruz, how in the world is he going to beat Trump? I mean, Ted Cruz is, I mean, Trump will tear him up because his 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 debate style is so not politician-like. And the politicians don't know how to come back when somebody says you're ugly. <laughs> right. And by the time the uh, the election rolls around, um, there will only be, what, 11 years left of uh, humanity, civilization. <laughs> so, you know, Beto's going to be in trouble. That's right. That's right. All right. So uh, earlier we talked about like legality and lawfulness and and morality. And we see John Cho, the Roldy. He's very much that's illegal. That's against the law. I'm not going to do that. And uh, we see that when they're paying the toll. We see that when he's going to cross the street uh, outside of the gas station and all of those things. And we see him kind of come full circle by the end where he sort of finds himself. And we see a similar journey with Kumar actually realizing that he has all these gifts and he should really apply apply them and do something good in the world. So I just want to kind of take this at a, this this is a coming of age story that's very powerful. And it, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I'm really, I'm trying really hard to shoehorn this in, but it's about um, empowerment and making yourself better. It's a self-improvement story. There's a, he, there's a big hero's journey in this movie. This This comedy actually does have something of a plot. It seems like it's, you could almost miss it, but it's there. And you're right, Daniel. It is a coming of age style self realization finale where all the characters finally get what they want and do the thing. Like Harold finally has the courage to talk to the girl. Kumar, what does he do? I don't know if he does anything, does he? I mean, you, you say he does save that one person on the operating table. Yeah, amazingly, like beautifully. And uh, Deadpool's all like into him about that. Uh, did you have a, did you have an issue with that though? I mean, aren't they committing fraud at that point? 
Well, they they aren't licensed, but you know, do you really need to be? I mean, somebody comes up to you and calls you a doctor and says, "We need you in the OR. We've got a multiple gunshot wound victim here." At some point, are you going to go? Yeah, maybe I'm not a doctor. Well, Cho is like, no, you know, like I'm not a doctor, but Kumar knows what he's doing. He's got the skills, so he has the ability and knowledge to do it, and uh, he's not afraid to do it. I, I I admire that. You admire it. I admire Kumar's abilities and his his uh, <laughs> his courage to do it. Yeah, he said okay, that. And if that was your wife on there, laying there on the slab with multiple gunshot wounds, and they go, "Oh crap, that guy's not a real doctor," you'd be like, eh, "I'm sure he knows what he's." Doing. Well, that's a that's not the situation though. They don't know that. Nobody knows that. And and Kumar knows what that he knows what he's doing, and no one else knows that he's not a doctor. So there is none of this, um, you know, reveal, right? And and oddly enough, my wife will soon be on the slab. Uh, she's going to have a uh, surgery in uh, a couple of weeks. Not for gunshots. <laughs> that you know about. Or will she? No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So, sounds all premeditated at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, so Robert, it sounds like you are all about uh, this medical licensure program that the state imposes where they cut down uh, half of the medical schools in the country so that they can drive up the wage rates of doctors and limit the supply and quality of healthcare in this country. Well, well, as the podcast's resident status, yes, of course I am. <laughs> no, Daniel, this is about fraud. This is not about licensure. This is about somebody purporting to be someone they're not. And when you are say, when 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 Deadpool comes up and is like, Dr. Kumar, we need you in the OR. And he's like, you know where I got this. I, I see this in, as an opportunity to maybe score some weed. I think he's going in it with the wrong intentions and he's committing fraud. So yeah, you I, got, like, I got a problem with it. You don't even like this character. Now, if he, if he had a little clinic where he was like Kumar's clinic and all under, you know, I'll beat anybody else's prices by 50%. And yet I'm still a really good guy, really good doctor, but I don't have a PhD after my name. I'd be like all for it. Fantastic. As long as the customer knows who you are and you're telling the truth and you're upfront about yourself and your abilities, fantastic. So, like, Am I taking crazy pills here? I feel like this is a perfectly reasonable position to have. Well, I mean, you can't know everything all at once. And so it's really impossible to be able to fulfill your, your fantasy of this fully informed uh, consent situation, especially when there's a gunshot wound victim on the slab in this uh, stoner movie. Robert. Okay, so you're seeing Kumar as a hero here. He saves that man's life, yes. He's a hero. And what if he had killed him? Well, then he's not a hero. Okay, and you're going to hold him perfectly responsible for his killing of the guy, right? No, no, the guy who shot him would be responsible for killing the guy. So Kumar has no responsibility as a fake doctor who kills a guy by impersonating a real doctor. Well, see, we're getting to some gray area. We're going to need to mitigate this with our guest. Rachel, what are your thoughts on this? On this impasse. I'm just here to talk about a stoner movie. (laughs) We get real. This is serious shit, Rachel. (laughs) We're going to burn this mother down, Pookie. (laughs) Did you notice in the beginning when there's a party and it's going, you know, this uh, let's get it started song. Except this time it said, let's get retarded. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't that the line? I thought that was the line. I always knew it was let's get it started. Well, I mean, there's multiple verses in a song and they, they're rhymey, right? So I think it's let's get it started in here. Let's get retarded in here or whatever. Like, you think so? I think they probably I think the, the let's get it started was the radio edit and let's get it retarded was like the club edit. That could be. I don't know. We'll have to go to like the lyrics machine dot com or I just made that up. That might be not even a thing. I know there used to be like a bunch of lyrics sites like you'd look for song lyrics and you'd get like 50 results. They'd all have like weird urls and whatnot trying to sell you spam we don't have a resident black eyed peas expert in the room retarded is that the original the band anarchist mom it, it is black eyed peas is that correct i know they sing something called let's get it started but i don't know if it's the same song or not well well this knows? is not important enough to waste this much time talking about it <laughs> you've already wasted so much time and robert's a business hippie he understands supply and demand <laughs> i wrote that down too me too must have been a very important part no, it is. This is where we can shoehorn in some economics because uh, Kumar thinks that this guy's just some dumb socialist hippie who's going to give him weed for cheap, like 40 bucks. And then the business hippie is like, well, it's going to be like six, no, 80 bucks because of how desperate you are, Kumar. 
And uh, yeah, I thought that that was um, that was well uh, well portrayed. Like yeah. there very limited supply. There was nowhere else he could get it on campus. And you know, as as we uh, know, in a situation like a hurricane, where um, you know bottles of water are going for a mint, uh, the higher the price they are, the more incentivized people are to bring more to that area and relieve uh, the situation. But the government, and this weed yeah. dealer is taking a huge risk to oh, bring yeah. this weed into this location. As we see in the film, there are these psychotic security guys who chase after anybody they think is smoking or has any. So this guy's a hero. He's much like those grocery stores in Texas that sell the CBD oil. Pretty much anywhere. I think you can get it in gas stations too. And yeah, they so are. This is a situation to- where the laws are creating artificial scarcity and not just anybody's willing to take the risk to bring this weed in. So even though Kumar grumbles about it, he ultimately does pay up. So he ultimately feels like he's getting his money's worth based on the uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. He he would have preferred to spend less. But I mean, everything I'd buy, I, I'd, I'd prefer to have spent less. But I'm willing to exchange that amount of money for the thing because I desire the thing more than the money and vice versa. It's mutually beneficial trade. We're both better off as the result of the trade. Absolutely. But what, yeah. what happens is, doesn't he end up like getting away with the weed bag? Or is that later in the film? That's, That's later. later. Later in the film, yeah. Okay. yeah they, he actually drops his 80 bucks worth of weed down the toilet. Oh, that's right. Right during the battle shits? The yes. Shits. You skag! <laughs> you sank my destroyer! <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but they used way too much toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I don't know if I can comment on that. I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> How wasteful. How wasteful. Well, you know, it's not, uh, it's not theirs, so... Um... Mm. battle or the galley the tragedy of the commons yes thank you thank you yeah that's an excellent point yeah if if it doesn't cost them anything uh at least directly for the amount they're using they're going to use more than the other ways would have similar to if there was universal health care seriously Indeed. it's like the toilet paper in taco shits here <laughs> if you're not paying for it you're going to use a heck of a lot more of it the demand will go through the roof and you'll get you'll use it for things that you wouldn't otherwise need it for. And, and all this unnecessary stuff will happen. Right. You remove the cost and all of a sudden something you would otherwise go, eh, is it really worth it? No. You're going, well, why not? Let's go get it checked out. It's an all you can eat buffet, toilet paper, buffet, <laughs> toilet paper for everybody until it runs out. In and then everybody, years, then things are not so good. Run out. And we're going to need uh, another green new deal for recycled toilet paper or something. You know, my wife and I, we used to watch this show called Cheapskates, I think is what it was called. And uh, it's about people who go to extreme lengths to save money. So like one of the guys um, used like an onion bag as a scrubber for his dishes. And uh, another lady wore the same pair of shorts every day for years, even after they fell apart. And she was like tying them on with a rope. And uh, the coup de gras was uh, the guy, the, the family who had a family cloth. Instead of toilet paper, they had a cloth Ooh. next to the toilet. And then they would launder this cloth or they'd have a stack of them or whatever, but they would launder them and then reuse them. I mean, it's very similar to like cloth diapering, right? In a way, mm, mm-hmm. but still yeah. nasty and toilet paper's cheap. I mean, come on. I mean, it's not like we're in Venezuela here. <laughs> <laughs> For now, it's cheap. Yeah. So, Robert, I want to go back to those uh, psycho uh, rent-a-cop wannabe cop guys. The um, Was it Princeton? Is that the school? Yeah. And in Jersey, uh, as I recall. Right. And and. They're they're chasing the guys and they they don't even see them and yet somehow they know who they are. It's kind of bizarre. But uh, when they do catch the business hippie, uh, the one guy is like, "Hold his throat, throat and groin! Come on, rookie!" <laughs> yeah, like you're not torturing him properly. Yeah, even though I don't think that these these campus cops, you know, they're on a kind of a different level than regular cops. I don't think they get quite the training to dominate like regular cops do. So I think they were a bit mis mit- misattributing cop tactics on uh, campus cops although campus cops do some crappy shit too it's, it's true but i don't know if they're as uh, insane as these guys are yeah now but the the, the cops, cops are. in the jail in the town are are even worse yeah you know and and i was surprised at how um openly derisive of police they were in this movie and and i get it i mean this is back when the left and i i envision this as very left-leaning people made this movie um but back then it was more like out of out of the bedroom and civil liberties kind of a thing, libertinism a little bit. Um, but also, I mean, they are a little bit calling out like racial profiling and police brutality. I mean, especially with the uh, the 
the black professor and they're reading um, civil disobedience. And they're like, oh, he's resisting. He's got a gun. It's a book. And, you know, they're like basically torturing the guy. And then um, uh, this is where um, Kumar finds that that bag of weed, right? Because the, the business hippie got arrested and then his mom bailed him out. Uh, right. Another example of how uh, the war on drugs impacts minorities and poor people. Like, yeah, much more than than somebody who's more affluent, right? Because they mm-hmm. can get bailed out or, or whatever, not have to spend the, the time in jail. Um, but uh, where I was also going with this is back to the racial profiling thing is in order to gain access to spring uh, Roldy from the jail, Kumar calls in a false report of gunshots. And all of the cops are like, yeehaw, strap up, you know, let's go and get us some shooting, you know? And uh, so that leaves the police station empty and he can go in and, and spring Roldy and get the weed. Uh, but the guys come back in and they have apprehended some guy from his bed who was sleeping as the suspect for this false report of a shooting because he's black. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to kind of like black lives matter type stuff. I, I, I got the joke, but it was so cartoonish that it got a bit of an eye roll from me. I mean, even I recognize that, you know, cops don't necessarily just go out and seek out and try to kill black people. They're not just like out hunting them. Uh, blacks do generally commit, you know, a, a majority of the, of the violent crimes. So, or at least proportional to their population size. So it's not necessarily that all cops are like horrific racists, but you have a lot of these laws, especially the war on drugs and that sort of things, which put people in these situations where cops are having to interact with, you know, peaceful people. Well, not even having to, but like doing it, you know, like um, I'm just, the word having to is, is, is almost like they, they should be doing it, you know? Well, incentivizing. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, they, they pick and choose what laws to enforce, right? I mean, there are murders on the books that go uninvestigated. Yeah, or at least... over half of uh, violent crimes aren't even reported to the police. The uh, the police officer that I spoke to, the retired NYPD police officer, he, he ended up kind of seeing the light and transferring off the undercover narcotics uh, division. And he transferred over to what's, I think he called it special crimes. It's kind of like the special victims unit. And he was sh- stunned because in in this narcotics division that he had transferred out of, there were a thousand officers and then he transferred over to this and they're, you know, arresting people for not necessarily, I mean, they're nonviolent crimes. The most, the bulk of the people they're arresting on these narcotics on the narcotic side. So he transfers over to civil uh, special, special crimes where he's investigating child abuse and rape, like victim crimes with true victims. And there were 22 officers on that in that division versus a thousand over in narcotics yeah you definitely see where the money is in that situation well let's lighten the mood a little bit and talk about jamie kennedy's cameo where he's the, uh, the close peer what are you the king of the forest tree hugger is that who's who jamie that was? kennedy that was jamie kennedy and robert who was jamie kennedy you're not answering my question jamie kennedy was apparently popular in the mid-2000s i think he had a television show similar to uh, like a pranking show is that right something like that I think a lot of people confuse him with uh, Seth Green or Tom Green. I think they're all kind of mixed up together in a blender, like that song from the night. Oh, okay, you're talking about the yeah the MTV show, Jamie Kennedy Experiment or something. Yes, like yes, yes, yes. That's it. Okay, and that was him. Yeah, that was peer. like a, that was like a um, hidden camera show, right? I don't know. No, a long time ago, Daniel. <laughs> well, our our memories are are failing us very poorly, very badly here. Okay, I didn't so even talk- realize that was him. Let's let's talk about what do you got on this close peer situation, Daniel? I know you want to talk about this. This is an important topic. Bring it. Well, so so it just kind of ties into the the movie in general. Like it starts out relatively straightforward and and based in somewhat level of reality, but then it gets further and further and further out uh, until the end. You know, you kind of are in this mystical uh, Mario saving the princess as Zorro with mushroom pizza people or something. But uh, this is one of those steps towards making it more weird. And that is this close peer situation where Kumar needs to pee on a bush. And then this random guy shows up and pees right next to him and like stares at him. And it reminds me of that meme where there's like a whole bunch of urinals. And then and they, they always say it's like, um, you know, someone's got to like tell you something like that's just totally stupid. Like, oh, by the way, I've never seen Game of Thrones or by the way, I'm um, vegan or keto or something like that or gluten free. And, you know, so they get up right next to you and there's like 50 other urinals they could have gone to. 
anyway, it was just one step further along into getting like a weirder and weirder movie. Um, you know, and NPH showing up being the uh, ladies man, coked out, tripping balls guy. And and uh, Rachel and I chatted about this um, prior to the show. Uh, this was before he had uh, made his announcement of coming out as as a gay man. And so uh, this role also led him into being Barney in that show, um, How I Met Your Mother, where he has a similar ladies man vibe. Um, but I think when this came out, like it was not far fetched to think that he was somewhat like that in a way, even though he said in an interview and they actually bill him in the credits, not as Neil Patrick Harris playing himself, but Neil Patrick Harris playing Neil Patrick Harris as a character because he wanted it to be clear that he's not behaving as he <laughs> would normally behave. So he's like he's playing a character in the movie. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the randomness of some of the weird shit that happens in this film is what sort of ruins it for me i suppose if you're high and you're watching this fine and then this thing happens and then this thing happens but the random nature of just you know i love random nature crap like if it's in a movie like airplane and just random crap happens and it's funny fine but for some reason in this film it it just seemed kind of strange like which is fine you're doing it for laughs and if it gets a laugh out of you all, all more power to you but it seemed like the the strange journey trip that they were going on. I didn't really seem, I mean, is there a scene in this film when they get like really stoned except for at the very beginning? Uh, yeah, mostly the very beginning. And then after they score a little bit at the campus and I think and then the cheetah with the cheetah. Yeah. Smoking with the cheetah. But, uh, it is like this escalation of it getting weirder and weirder. Like we've got freak show who's, um, played by uh, one of the guys from, I think special victims unit, yeah, right? Chris- Christopher Maloney. I think that's, I don't know if that's how you say his name. Yeah, and I was really surprised because when I first um, saw this movie, you know, years ago, I had no idea that was him. And then in rewatching it, I thought, well, that's that guy. That's so crazy because I don't see him as that, like being able to do that kind of a character. Um, I thought it was like a Chris Elliott type mm-hmm. um, in a way. Not not that he looks anyway, uh, but but that was like one weird escalation, right? Like this super weird dude who's like so a, over the top pro Jesus uh, has a smoking hot wife <laughs> with the smoking hot wife. And he's like. <laughs> he says uh they can you know fuck his wife and <laughs> he even says it and then uh then he's like very menacingly when he comes back in he seems to have forgotten that he told him that uh but it was just another thing that made it really weird and and uh one other note i saw about this is when they're walking through the guy's yard and there's all those dogs in the kennel apparently um john cho didn't know there was a german shepherd in that in the uh kennel next to him and so when he walked by and the dog started barking really loudly uh he didn't expect it and so he really did like jump or get startled and it's like a, a real reaction in the movie nice oh and another well, thing i read is that okay kumar daniel kumar is played by cal Penn, and cal Penn is a vegetarian so two things about that uh well he's vegetarian and he has nut allergy so the vegetarian aspect is the sliders that they made they eat at the end they're hamburgers they made veggie burgers for him uh and then in the police scene where he's in the air conditioning duct and then falls through the first time they shot that, they had to create dust. And so they used, used walnuts, crunched up walnuts to make dust. He had a reaction to that and had to go to the hospital. So they had mm. to reshoot it using chocolate dust. Interesting. You did a lot more homework on this than I did. Well, I was trying to sound informed on such a prestigious film that has <laughs> so much to tell us. <laughs> Is there a website for that? <laughs> oh, well, we're going to have a show notes page at uh, lastnightage.com. slash 75 is where we're going to have that. Um you know, we're actually getting pretty long already. And I, I, I know we've kind of been meandering uh, as I have not led the discussion very well. But uh, uh, Rachel, why don't we go through a couple of your notes and then Robert's and then we'll wind this down. Well, I guess one of the things that I had written down is the fact where they're in that, that the convenience store and the extreme guys are basically tearing the place up and they're afraid to call the cops to stop the, the guys from vandalizing the store, basically. The, that, yeah, that- I, I wondered that too. Like, why didn't the owner call the cops or yeah. do anything really other than just kind of sit there and be helpless against these guys. I mean, that doesn't, I don't know much about the people in the Northeast, but you know, surely they don't just stand there. I know in Texas, they wouldn't just stand there while somebody tore their store up. No, that's his livelihood right there. Why would you just stand there? I don't know if <laughs> and there's very famous stories of Koreans on rooftops. I mean, <laughs> this guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, I think Texas would be uh, a lot different than New Jersey. Like in New Jersey, you can't even pump your own gas. So that was another, thing in, in this in this movie that was a little bit um inaccurate because they actually shot up the film in canada but the gas station says self-serve 
And well, you can't do that in, in uh, New Jersey or Oregon. I think those are the only two states in Oregon just started relaxing on that a little bit, I think. Yeah. And weren't there people complaining that they, that they were going to have to pump their own gas now or something? I mean, I remember and, like maybe a year or so ago seeing something about that. I'm like, really? I've been pumping my gas since I was 16. Well, the counter arguments to that are that there's going to be a whole lot of accidents because people are too stupid to pump their own gas and like they're just going to drive away with the thing in the car and they're going to cause explosions and whatnot. I and have seen that happen. Was not the, that, well, not well, the explosion. I'm sorry, what? I said, I have seen that happen where people drive off with the nozzle in their car. Well, it but, does happen from time to time, but the idea that that's going to be a real huge problem is somewhat ridiculous. But then the other argument was, well, then what are these people, these attendants going to do for work? What about them? Well, that was the reason that the laws were put in place that you required um, to not do self-service because think of all my gerbs, saving all my gerbs over there. And it's an admission that, you know, the market prefers cheaper gas and that the law is actually in place is harming the consumer. Yeah. And in a way, it's it's showing other states that uh, they can charge more in gas taxes because, well, you can still charge this much in Oregon and Texas or uh, New Jersey and people are buying gas. So we can throw on some more road taxes on there. Can we talk about real quick about one of my pet peeves? I'd love to talk about one of your pet peeves, but I'm right here, Robert. <laughs> so at one point in this movie, Kumar thinks, you know, a, ra- a, a raccoon bites him and he's got like blood all over his whatever or his shirt. And he's like, I might have rabies. We need to go to the hospital. And OK, fine. So they go to the hospital and, you know, Kumar is waiting for like a few minutes and then he comes out and he's like, I don't have rabies. That is not how that works. As a hypochondriac who has an irrational fear of getting rabies. I know it's like one in a million or one in like 300 million, whatever. Don't come at me. It's fine. It's, I know it's completely irrational. What you do in the case where you suspect a rabies situation is you keep the animal that bit you and they cut off its head and they send it to a lab and then they can test to see if the rabies vaccine, the virus is in the animal's brain. That's how you can tell. You can't just go to a hospital and there's some magical test that can tell you in five minutes that you don't have it. That's not how that works. Movie, you're a liar. Okay, that's all I got. Well, and if you don't have the animal and you suspect it has rabies, then the person who got bitten has to take all the shots. Yeah. If, if they can't get the animal to send it set off. I used to work for a vet clinic in my formative years as a teenager. And we 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 cut off several heads and mailed them to College Station. Right. For testing. Yeah. If you suspect it, you got to get a whole bunch of shots. It's it's not something that you just know. But, but I, anyway, was... I know it's a comedy, but I don't want people to get their misconceptions about rabies because it will kill you if you develop symptoms. But it's super, super rare. Well, now I'm, I'm really glad that uh, our dog has received her rabies vaccination because uh, and she has a little tag that says she's she's had it because i couldn't she she likes to bite right she likes to nip people she's uh, got healer in her and she likes to shepherd people around herd them around um and i've i've got you know some scratches and whatnot from her sharp little teeth um but yeah if somebody were to get bit by her i mean yeah it would be unfortunate but i wouldn't want them cutting her head off uh to see if she's got rabies well, they'll they'll quarantine them for ten days if they if you have a dog bite, they'll quarantine the dog. Now puppies are different, but like they'll quarantine a dog for ten days, and then if they don't show any signs of rabies, then they don't have to cut their head off. Okay, yeah. all right. I'm not and as a human. Sure. The incubation <laughs> period for rabies is, uh, I think, like six. You have do have time. I okay. could be wrong on that. I'm not an expert, of course. Look into it yourself. But all right, anyway. so Robert just covered himself, so he's not a liar. He's not sure. I could just be wrong about things, Daniel. I'm I'm like. Kumar, except I tell the truth about stuff. You're extreme. You're extreme truthing. Who gets in a kayak and throws them down an aisle and calls it extreme kayak? Douchebags. <laughs> jacked up douchebags on Monster Energy Drink with jacked up truck. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Well, what were y'all thoughts? y'all's thoughts on Harold and Kumar stealing their car? Yeah, I was not a fan of that. <laughs> Two wrongs yeah. to make a right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was... Some kind of like standing up to them was would have been appropriate, but yeah, stealing their car, not so much. And Neil Patrick Harris and PH stealing their car, all mm-hmm. felt inappropriate. And and even though he offers to buy them a meal and he, he says, Well, that's why I'm buying you a meal, dicks. Um, I don't think that excuses it. You know what I mean? Like I'd still be rather upset. Um especially with the love well, in the back when he Yeah, but but who leaves keys in the car when you got like some stoned out party person in the back seat? I don't know. It just seems irresponsible. Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed the um, the drive by scene where he's out the sunroof with the women and he's like doing the coke off the hooker's butt. 
I know that's not appropriate, but it's hilarious. It's a comedy film. Well, it makes it more funny that he came out a couple years after that. Hmm. Yeah, Robert, you caught that earlier, right? Like, so this movie came out in 2004. And, and when did he announce? Like three years later, maybe 2007? I think you told me 2006. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of years later then. All right. Um, what else do we have in your notes here? Well, I've got the sketch artists at the end. Oh, uh, yes. Bullets, my only weakness. How did you know? Yes, the sketch artist is uh, is hilarious. I must have missed that. And it's when the credits are rolling and they're talking about like the news report of um, the police are looking for two individuals and they think they have a very accurate description of them. And it's like a cartoon caricature of like a Chinaman and like a Muslim guy. Yeah. Like Hindu a guy. Full on with the turban style and like rice paddy hat, you know, like like the old um, what were they Warner Brothers cartoons where they were, you know, mischaracterizing like Japanese people when they were the the quote unquote enemy mm-hmm. World War II yeah. style. Yeah. Something that if you did it today would be horribly racist. Right. But because, you know, they're who they are and, and this was made at the time it was made. Like I said earlier, I don't think that this movie could get made today um, where, you know, back then they were like pushing the boundaries in so many areas. And it seemed like that's what the left was trying to do. And in a way, they're still doing that now. But in a very um, specific way, it's like you have to accept me being gender confused or whatever but you can't talk about it or say the wrong pronoun. Otherwise I'll get really upset. Like it's a really weird situation. Yeah. I mean, this is a time when they're, I mean, they're obviously making a comedy film and they're the butt of the joke or they're kind of self referencing tropes and stereotypes and that sort of thing. But yeah, I just don't see this movie getting made today. Uh, I tend to agree with you, Daniel. When did the last movie inspired a chain, right? There's like three of these. Yes. Yeah. They escaped from Guantanamo in the second one. And, uh, it's funny because I think we mentioned that in the pre-show, um, how Obama had said he was going to shut it down and he never did. Uh, but they actually have George Bush, a, a character version of George Bush in this uh, Guantanamo one. And uh, he's actually like a cool guy in it. They smoke weed with him <laughs> in Texas. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, I find that offensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robert, what do you think of their speech at the end when they're about to go down on the hang glider to their goal? You know, the 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 thing they've been striving for this whole time where Kumar's talking about their, their families came there escaping persecution, poverty, and hunger uh, to live in a land where you could have hundreds of different types of burgers or types of deodorant. Um, America, you know, the pursuit of happiness and the, the American dream, that whole speech. I thought that was actually kind of, you know, I mean, it's a little patriotic, but it, it also sh- highlights the difference between sort of, sort of the more socialist economies like, like a Bernie Sanders would want where there should be only one type of deodorant. I mean, he literally says they can have hundreds of different types of burgers here. Right. No, I thought the speech was, like you said, almost exactly like you said, and I put it in my notes as he makes an immigrant in search of freedom speech because it's a recognition that people move towards economic opportunity and, and freedom. freedom. Right. And that's what you get when you have a free market, or we would if we really did have a free market. We have a vestige market, and it allows you for multiple competing people to produce different products and for the market to choose the best one. And for people to voluntarily hand over their dollars for the ones they prefer. And then those rise to the top and, you know, the ones that fail sink down. But in a socialist kind of situation or a communist situation, you'd have one choice and that's it. And that one choice is regardless of whether or not you like it. I mean, they'll just keep producing, it. like, regardless of, you know, you, you <laughs> whether, you know, it's, it's all done by like quotas and like some kind of government manager who dictates that, you know, this is how much, how many pounds of cheese we need to create or whatever. Whereas, you know, the, the, the consumer is the ultimate decider in a, in a free market. So I liked it. I liked the speech a lot. Um, more in terms of what I gleaned from it than probably the actual text. Right. Yeah. Sort of like our interpretation of, of it, our reading of it, I would think. Yeah. But yeah, people keep moving from, you know, horribly economically oppressive countries into economically, relatively economically free places. That's what we even see that in, um, within the United States, like people are moving from certain states to other states. Uh, Like in the pre-show, Rachel, you talked about if you were a user of cannabis, you would probably look at moving to Oklahoma. And uh, my wife and I were looking at Idaho or other places like that due to the homeschool laws. And you even see these migrations from these high tax, high regulation states to other states, such as Texas or Colorado, people moving from New York, New Jersey, and California um, to these other places to escape those regulations and high taxes. Meanwhile, they introduce those ideas that they're trying to escape into the local, you know, political arena 
And those states become more and more like those oppressive states that they left. It's like a really unfortunate situation. It's like they don't put two and two together. Like the reason we moved here is to get away from this crap, but this place doesn't have that crap. And we kind of like some of that crap. So now we're going to have more of that crap. Yeah. They just don't recognize that what causes like the cause and effect situation of these policies. Ridiculous. They're like children. Yeah. There was a, there was a lady in Austin, Texas, which it's, it's pretty expensive. Austin's the more liberal part of, Texas uh, state capital. And there was a lady in Austin and she was complaining that her property taxes were really expensive. And she said, I just don't understand why my taxes are so expensive. Every time they, they put something on the ballot for a park or public works, I voted in favor of it. And my taxes are so high. I don't understand. <laughs> it's a and mystery. It, yeah. It's like, <laughs> where do you think that money comes from lady? And so the, the people that move from these high tax states and they come to Texas, they, they turn around and they vote to implement all these things that increase their taxes. And it's like, you just left the state that the taxes were too high. And now you're going to come here and vote for the same exact policies that made the cost of living so high in the state that you came from. Yeah. But progressivism is a religion. It's not, it's not like a until they had to pay for it. Well, it's the other guy who pays for it, right? In their mind. Yeah. It's the rich, you know, those those bastards. They they got to pay their fair share anyway. Right. And and nobody realizes that they are in a relative sense to the rest of the world. You are the rich. If you're in the United States and you make more than uh, what is it? $35,000, you are the 1%. It's true. You can How are we doing on time, Daniel? It seems like we're we're winding this thing up. Yeah, we are, we we should be. We should be because we are already over time. So we can do what we do is the uh, final summaries and reviews. If Robert, you want to kick it off and then we will go to our guest, Rachel, and then I'll close it out. Yeah. So this is a comedy from 2004 and it surprised me about how many times it made me laugh. I wasn't expecting it to make me laugh. Usually I'm just stone faced these old comedies because usually comedies do not age well at all. But this one actually made me laugh three good out laugh out louds moments. And so, you know, that that gets points for that for sure. All right, don't um, leave us in suspense. What were the moments? Okay, bullets, my only weakness, shotgun anus, and calling the weed bag a filthy whore. <laughs> that was a cute little thing. When they did the little weed bag montage, the way it went dark at the end, that was fucking brilliant. I loved that. Because usually you have these little montages where everything's just happy times. But for some reason, they decided to take it you know, to a dark place at the end where he's like, they resent each other. And he's like, yeah, this is great. Funny. Go make yeah. me a sandwich. It's amazing how they can make domestic violence, like funny. And, and somehow they pull it off. It is, it is amazing. This film is amazing. Continue, Robert. Yeah. So um, I appreciated the, um, you know, the things it gives to talk about. It's, it's not the, the deepest film, but it, it wasn't trying to be, it was just trying to, you know, have a good time and make you laugh. And I think it succeeded for the most part. Um, I, you know, in a comedy, they can get away with having a bunch of random elements. If this was a drama, there's a bunch of times where, and then a cheetah pops up. <laughs> I mean, I, I know they set it up in the little radio in the police station. I heard that. It still doesn't forgive the fact that they're riding a cheetah like a 10 minutes later. But fine. It is what it is. You know, it's fine. It, it's, it's comedy. So you get to hand wave all kinds of, you know, normal criticism. And just say, hey, did you have a good time? Did you laugh? Yeah, well, then it set out to do what it wants. And it obviously did. And this movie made money, and they made a couple more of these, and more power to them. Um, the acting, you know, it's not blowing your doors off, but it's fine. Um, these are, you know, some decently talented people that got together and made this, so that's fun. Um, I'm going to give it a 7, straight 7. It's a solid 7, you know. It's not great, but maybe maybe that's too high of a score. Uh, I don't care. It's fine. Daniel, what did you think? All right, that was a hit, Robert. You sunk my battle shit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed this film, and I laughed more than three times. I, I laughed like a freaking idiot watching this, and, and I think it was just because it was so ridiculous, and it kept escalating the ridiculousness, and uh, in a way, yeah, it was disjointed, but it's also a comedy, and a stoner film. And so the, the further they can take it and the crazier they can make it, I, I, I think it, I have to give it a pass on that. And at the end of the day, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a story about two guys who find themselves and they can only be satisfied by achieving the desire that they have, you know, the goal they have in mind and all the harrowing stuff that happens in between makes them desire it even more. So in a way it shows you how going through the trial by fire, 
actually improves you as a person, having to face struggles and overcome them. This is an empowering movie. And it's it's a weird way to look at it because it is, you know, a stupid stoner movie. But at the end, you know, they're better people for it. And uh, I, I got to give it props for that. And because it's like such a stoner movie, I, I'm going to go with a 4.2. But because there's two of the guys and I like both of them, I'm going to go with 8.4 total. So they, they both get a 420 or 4.20. So 8.40. It's a weird, weird score. But uh, uh, we're only supposed to go a decimal point deep. I went, you know, one more. Uh, Rachel, your thoughts. It wasn't as terrible as I thought it would be. <laughs> I don't usually watch stoner films, which I guess is ironic. But, you know, it was actually pretty funny. It was funny. I actually now want to watch some of the other ones just to see, you know, can they top riding a cheetah or Neil Patrick Harris doing drugs off of hookers, hind parts. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, I would probably go with Robert and stay about a seven because I, I would... I wouldn't recommend it to a friend, but I think I would go out and watch it. The other ones just to see what they're like. All right. So maybe it's like a, a bit of a guilty pleasure now that you've kind of been exposed to it. You're like, oh, I'm kind of curious. You know, it was kind of fun. Yeah, I think so. I but, think so. But not so much you'd want your friends and family to know you're watching it, even though you're now on this public and very popular show talking about <laughs> how you've seen this movie. Uh, yes, I would. Think, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not like embarrassed that I watch it, but I'm not going to go out and tell everybody I watched it. If they ask me, did you watch it? I'll say, yeah, I watched that because Daniel didn't want to spend 15 bucks on a movie. Yes. I'm the bad guy. Make me the bad guy. <laughs> extreme. <laughs> oh, one thing I thought that was hilarious is the extreme guys had all those uh, lame nineties uh, songs like Wilson Phillips and stuff like that. I thought that was pretty funny. Oh yeah. When they were playing it and they're like, these guys are posers. Yeah. But I like Wilson Phillips. I like that song. I'm a loser too. So, <laughs> Well, just hold on. That's right. And uh, if you could stick around, we'd love to have you on for our Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is available for our Patreon supporters. So people can find that at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. And uh, they can find your show at CannabisHealsMe.com. And what was your next one that's coming out? Who's the guest on that one? Well, my guest on next Friday is going to be John Beza. He is a former NYPD narco undercover narcotics officer. So we're going to talk to him about the... I guess the failure of the drug war that he saw up close and personal. And then on Monday show on her healing story, we're going to talk to a lady about how she used cannabis to uh, put her Graves disease in remission, which is a form of um, thyroid disease. All right. That sounds good. And uh, I want to thank you for being a fantastic guest with us uh, tonight, talking about this show or this movie, which, um, you know, like we, like we said in the open, it's like, does this movie help or hurt? when it comes to the perception of cannabis and what, you know, what medical benefits there are. So I'm, I'm glad that there's someone like you out there publicizing those healing stories and then also doing your Thursday stuff where you're kind of investigating more of the uh, downstream effects of, of the government interventions that are related to it. Uh, Robert, any comments before we talk about the next movie we're going to do next week? Yeah. I just want to thank Rachel for uh, coming on. It's great having her um, next week. I will be back on video. I'll be on the west side of the mountains. I'm driving back tomorrow. So for those of you who were uh, upset that you only heard my sweet voice, ugly mug, back on the uh, next week, starting with what movie, Daniel? We're going to do for Father's Day, Legends of the Fall with the professional asshole who we have not had on in quite a while. And um, apparently, and I haven't seen this movie in a long time, but apparently there's a lot of libertarian leanings in the father character played by Anthony Hopkins in this movie. So I'm actually really excited to watch this one and see what we can uh, parse out of it next week with the professional asshole. Yeah. I remember that movie fairly well. I, I remember seeing it not too long ago and I think he's absolutely right. The Anthony Hopkins character, I think the movie is set at a time when the United States is at war and the Brad Pitt character and has, you know, there's a bunch of brothers and they're deciding whether or not they're going to go to the war and Hopkins is just like, don't go, you idiots, as I recall. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be a good one. Yeah, I agree. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We haven't had him on in a while. And uh, he's a good guy. So look forward to that. And uh, everyone, this has been uh, Last Nighter's episode 75. So you can find the show notes more at lastnighter.com slash 25. We will have a link to Rachel's work on the page and uh, other show notes related to what we talked about tonight. As we rode a cheetah all the way to White Castle to get some sliders for their beefy goodness, even though Cal Penn's vegetarian. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week for Legends of the Fall. Uh, good night from last night.
All right. And we have a few more minutes with the actual Anarchy audience before we get into that last night or not the last night's first show. That's what we just did. Uh, the Kathleen Turner Overdrive. Uh, so this is a this is a time, Rachel, where we have a few more minutes with our anarchist audience, the show within the show. So is there anything that you felt was a bit too racy to say to the normies back in the last nighters portion that you want to throw out there now, just like really shock people related to the movie or just about anything. I mean, whatever you want. I think I said what I wanted to say to the normie. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's good because you weren't holding back at all. Now, Robert, you usually have something wound up by this point. Is there anything that you wish you'd said in the last portion that you didn't say? No, I always get my best ideas like a few days from now when I'm like in the shower or when I'm doing something stupid like mowing the lawn, which is what I was doing today. And then just random thoughts will appear and like, oh, that's what I should have said. It's, you know, regret. You got to live with it. You got to live with life. Yeah. What are you going to do about it, Mr. Miyagi? Is that, is that, is that, is that one of his things? Well, that's, that's a line that the, uh, the extreme guys say to uh, John Cho outside of the, oh, right. when he's like in a stand up to them and then he steals their truck or their, whatever it is, uh, Bronco, Ford Bronco. Yeah. And then did you, do you like how the, uh, it was night and then all of a sudden it's daylight and then they're taking off and the thing and the cops still hadn't got to them. Yeah. Don't ask questions. You know, <laughs> It's little things, little things bug me just a little bit. And uh, oh, our professional asshole guest, he says, uh, did anyone ever catch that in Harold's dream, Maria's full name was Maria Quesadilla? I no. think I remember. I think I remember hearing that, but didn't make note of it. It's on the, the like the Zorro style movie poster, I think. Yeah, that dream was crazy where he gets knocked out from getting hit by the tree. And then uh, he wakes up with the cheetah kissing on him or whatever. I'm trying to. Re- I think that's what it was. Anyway, is that what happened? Well, no, they're riding the cheetah. Cho gets knocked off by the tree branch. Yeah. And then it's Cal Penn licking him. Yeah. Why was he licking them? I didn't understand that. It's just escalation of weirdness. All right. Well, we're about to get escalated in a little bit more weirdness. We're going to go into the Kathleen Turner Overdrive. Available for our Patreon supporters at actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. Give us likes, subscribes, reviews, and all that other good business at uh, the iTunes, soon to be called Apple Podcast. They made an announcement the other day. They're shut down the old iTunes. Finally put that horse out to pasture. Uh, but uh, go ahead and check it out. At the show notes page, actualanarchy.com slash 132. And also check out our guest show, cannabisheelsme.com. Rachel, you've been a fantastic guest. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on for this ridiculous movie. Oh, I had a great time. It was uh, it was as fun as I imagined smoking pot might be. <laughs> well, I don't know what our THC content is. <laughs> but uh, we had a lot of fun with you as well. Uh, any final comments, Robert, before we get into the Kathleen Turner Overdrive? Let's do it. Welcome back for tomorrow. No, next week, right? Why did I say that? Next week for Legends of the Fall. Looking forward to it with a professional asshole. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Robert. We're so high right now. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do